she was a world famous scientist, loved by the American nation. Her importance within American anthropology was huge. She was one of the people who helped to create it. She made sure that when she was in a room, you knew she was there and who she was. There was never a topic on which she wasn't willing to say a few words on education, on family life, on sexuality. She was an oracle. She had something to say about absolutely everything. At the time of her death, she was America's first woman of science and among the three best known women in the United States. I knew, of course, that women used their brains and did things because my mother and my grandmother had done so. And I knew that marriage and children and using your brains weren't incompatible. A hundred years ago, the United States was well on the way to becoming the world's first superpower. Millions of immigrants from across the globe had provided America with an almost limitless supply of cheap labor, eager to sign up to the American dream. Well, in the 1920s, there was a strong undercurrent of racism in American society. There was a belief that cultural differences derived from innate biological genetic uh, components. And uh, this was manifested in policies that restricted severely certain groups of people on the grounds that they were genetically and biologically and socially and intellectually and morally inferior. The flame of southern skies. I'm gonna stake me out a claim in paradise. Cause I'd like to see some more of some more. There'd always been a racist wing of anthropology. Um, and this uh, reached its culmination in the eugenics movement. Some of whom were geneticists within anthropology who endorsed this hereditarian position. Back then, the concept of nurture was barely developed. And what was important was the concept of nature. But nature didn't mean human nature. Nature meant race and racial variation. In other words, there was a powerful branch of anthropology that endorsed the belief, widely held in American society back then, that being white made you superior to everybody else on the planet. And since being white was all down to one's genes, there was nothing anyone not white could do to change this. But not everyone shared this view. Margaret Mead arrived in Pongo Pongo, on the Samoan island of Tutuila. The first thing I had to do was to learn the language. Now, this was new. Anthropologists were not required to learn the language in those days. They were required to learn about the language, to learn the grammar, to take down very careful texts, but not to use it in everyday life. Dear Dr. Boaz, I have now a vocabulary of about 500 words. I can express any type of idea except some so-called subjunctive expressions with very little difficulty. I have talked to 10-year-old children for 15 and 20 minutes and made myself understood. I am quite confident now that I will be able to handle the language well enough for the requirements of my problem. The two biggest problems of fieldwork one is loneliness, the fact that you are totally away from home. And the other is what we refer to as culture shock. So I learned how to be courteous, how to ask questions courteously. I learned how to sit and stand and receive a gift and start a dance. I learned never to speak standing up erect. Uh, if someone else was seated and always to bend over very far over in front when you walked in front of someone of rank <laughs> As Mead discovered more and more about the Samoan adolescents she'd been sent to study It dawned on her that there was something rather unusual about the way they'd been brought up 
children never learn the meaning of a strong attachment to one person. And because early childhood does not provide them with violent feelings, there are no such feelings to be rediscovered during adolescence. Mead discovered in Samoa a version of the extended family where uh, children did not have to live within this emotional um, pressure cooker of the nuclear family, that uh, in this environment the, there was less tension within parent-child relations and generally um, emotions was more diffuse. All of which differed vastly from life back home. Long past midnight, then at last there is only the mellow thunder of the reef and the whisper of lovers as the village rests until dawn. Adolescence was not a time of stress and uh, angst and fighting and rebelliousness, but rather a time when adolescents could experiment with intimacy, with sexuality, and Mead found this very liberating. Indeed, so different was growing up in Samoa compared to the States, that Mead was moved to call Samoan adolescence a period of perfect adjustment. These things that made it hard for adolescents here weren't there. So I was able to come back and say that adolescence is not necessarily the kind of time that we've made it in Europe and America. That the kind of stress that we put on young people induces the kind of sturm und drang, the storm and stress that exists, but it isn't necessary. Here then was the proof. Mead's message was simple. Humans weren't just determined by their biology. What she offered was the sense that we can make choices about the kind of society we want to be. We have that freedom. 